great year for the Jackson Center. Our endowment increased, not enough, but significantly um, due to a lot of work by our staff and our chair. Uh, and we had a number of programs. I'm sure uh, Greg will tell you more than I will about them. But they culminated in the immigration program last week, which was fantastic. Uh, those of you who weren't there, you really missed something. And, and I'm delighted that we got into a sort of a contemporary issue. Uh, certainly, Justice Jackson had several decisions that uh, impacted on immigration, but uh, we had a real learning experience, and it was a dynamic, uh, very effective program. And he's flying over the ocean tonight uh, to London, but I want to thank John Q. Barrett for all the work he did in making that program uh, a tremendous success. Speaking of success, I particularly want to thank uh, Doug Neckers, our chair for the last two years. He has provided real leadership for this center and has done a terrific job. And we're all so grateful for your leadership and your contributions to the center. Um, it hasn't been an easy year for Doug. I mean, his house burned down. Or <laughs> uh, Sue, his delightful wife, has had some health problems. Uh, his business is sort of at a turning point and one thing and another. But he was always there. He provided our leadership and our inspiration. And I would like to ask for a Round of applause for Doug Necker. Now, he has given us a platform to move forward in the year ahead. As many, most of you know, probably all of you know, uh, we were successful in the downtown revitalization initiative. I couldn't believe we asked for a million and a half dollars, and we got a million and a half dollars. I just, I just couldn't believe it. But this will all go into construction. You won't recognize the entrance to the Jackson Center when we're finished, and. It's going to enhance our ability to provide excellence in programming and uh, uh, be a, a community center. We really are a critical part of downtown, and I'm delighted that we were recognized as such. Finally, let me say that you're here because you've already contributed to the center, but uh, I guess old Mayor Daly used to say, vote early and often. <laughs> and I, my, my message to you is, don't wait. This year, we need your support as soon as you can possibly give it. I know most of us wait till the end of the year to make our uh, contributions to uh, various charities, but we ask that you do everything possible to support us now when we need it uh, the very most. We look forward to a great year ahead. Uh, Greg Peterson, you have had a vision, and I think we have actually exceeded what your ideas were in the beginning. And, and I, I believe we will continue to do so and so I thank you.
And I thank every one of you for the support that you have given to the center. I'm sorry to have to come back as chair. <laughs> I really am. It wasn't something I sought, but uh, actually I remember being in Congress and an old Texas congressman told me, he says, I run every way possible. Best way is unopposed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was unopposed for the chairman. I love the introduction, Stan. Outstanding. As I... Uh, once, as Susan said, you know, you're former this, former that, former everything in the, that could possibly be. And as one old light heavyweight champion of the world named Willie Pastrano said, Greg, it's better to be a has-been than a never was. So welcome back to the chairmanship. <laughs> By the way, uh, this is a phenomenal book. And I, and I want to just call out Kathy again. You know, talk about a labor of love for many, many years. I bring up all these books because those were required for me to buy them simply because on the next to the last page, if not the last page, there is a picture of my wife. That alone should <laughs> ramp up the sales dramatically. <laughs> those are gone. It's been phenomenal. When uh, Stan just mentioned the fact that uh, in 2001, this organization got started with the Dan Brattons, the Carl Kappas, the Betty Linnays, Bruce Janowski's, Raleigh Kidders, and if I go on, I'm going to miss some of somebody else, but guys who had a thought, a vision, and a building we didn't know what the hell to do with. A 19,000 square foot building, and we weren't sure what we were going to do with 500 square feet of that. Nevertheless, a whole lot of folks had a, a vision as to what it possibly could be. To answer your question, Stan, we had no idea where we, that we would be where we are today. I think it's just a, a phenomenal statement to the energy, the education. And as I look out the room, I could go and identify every one of you in some form or fashion have, in fact, been part of that progress, which we've gone from 2001 to 2017 today, and much of which is chronicled in this incredible book by Kathleen Evans, and I, and I thank her for that. But we all stand on the shoulders of the originators, the Betty Linnays, the Carl Kappas, the Dan Brands. We cannot underestimate. We heard Chautauqua. We know that Chautauqua is most interested in becoming, partnering with us through Mike Hill, but I'm sure we will educate him on the fact that Dan when he became our first executive director, and during the time of which he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which was a blow to us, he sat down and wrote the vision statement. He's got a document like this that he wrote and Juanita gave to us after he passed away, which in fact is the book print. If you look at where we are today, Stan, you'd say, my God, so prescient was in fact this guy named Dan Bratton. And since that time, through board members, volunteers, uh, educators, we've been involved in a, a tremendous amount of programs here at the Jackson Center, and I'm just honored that tonight we have a special speaker and President Ken Gormley. I'm thrilled to be able to say President Ken Gormley, because he brought to us on many early occasions, and Laura, I will try to not belie any confidences, okay? But... Uh, Ken and I go back to 2003. You were speaking at Chautauqua on the subject of what you're going to talk about today. And I was a guy who, you know, as shy as I am, uh, <laughs> brought a camcorder, and I didn't ask for his permission. I just sat there and watched him talk about the Truman steel seizure case, and I videotaped it, and he was a good sport. And that became, began a relationship with both his wife, Laura, and Ken. And... That led to programming at the Jackson Center for our benefit, in fact, the steel seizure case, and based on one you did at Duquesne with Ken Heckler, among others. And we've had the benefit of not only Ken's guidance on so many fronts, but also the fact that we've ridden on the shoulders of people who were of his ilk. I was telling him earlier tonight, I don't know of anybody who's a more great, best, great 
connector than he with all kinds of people. I don't think I'm bad, but he's the best. And over time, we at the Jackson Center have had those connections with some really incredible, historically interesting people. So, and some of them have passed away. And I just want to pause and reflect briefly on some of those whose shoulders we continue to stand on. William Coleman, Chief Judge Kay, Barrett Prettyman, Ken Heckler, Phil Neal, who was one of Jackson's law clerks, and Judy Klinger, of course, part of the Klinger family, and they've been intimately involved, and many, many more, just to name a few. But my job is simple. My job is to introduce President Ken Gormley, uh, who I've known going from Dean, Professor Gormley, Dean Gormley, President Gormley, and here on the eve of his, I think it's his 20th anniversary with his lovely wife, Laura. 21? 31. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I'm honored to uh, introduce Ken Gormley. Ken? Oh, thank you, Greg, and thanks so much uh, to all of you. I want to thank Susan Moran Murphy for being such a gracious uh, host to me and my wife, Laura. Uh, and also, Greg Peterson, who I have known for a long time. Actually, Greg, you don't, you don't even remember. It was 1998. You, I have a picture of you when I was doing the Archibald Cox book here. And so you started interviewing me. He doesn't even know. People just blur together because he interviews everyone in sight. But um, as we know, it's actually Cindy is the reason we all love him. So. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I, I want to also extend my congratulations to the outgoing board chair, uh, Doug Neckers, and also, it, as we call it in the legal profession, um, our recidivist board chair, Stan Lundreen. Congratulations. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, I should say. And all of the officers and board members of the Robert Jackson Center for inviting me to speak at this special event, honoring truly one of the great American public servants who, as you know, uh, made his home here in Frewsburg and Jamestown, practiced law there uh, a hundred years ago and is now in the pantheon of heroes, in my view, among the nation's greatest public servants in our history. And speaking of that, too, I, I want to give a shout out to our interns here. Uh, why don't you guys stand up again, our interns for the summer at the Jackson Center. Um, I always remind myself that they are the future leaders and public servants who will be uh, running the show, and really the Jackson Center is one of the best places. And some of you will probably go on to Duquesne Law School if you're really smart. <laughs> uh, but tonight we're going to go back uh, a half century to talk about an historic constitutional case that frankly lots of uh, people don't ever hear about, don't know about. Uh, and I always say is the granddaddy of the cases dealing with presidential power. I've taught constitutional law my whole career. Um, let me ask you, how many of you know anything about the steel seizure case in 1952? Okay. How many of you were alive and remember it happening? Okay. Yeah, we do have. Um, so th this takes place during the Korean War in an effort by President Truman to avert a strike of 600,000 steel workers, many of them where I'm from in Pittsburgh, uh, I can tell you that this uh, historic case that involved pitting the president against Congress and really the Supreme Court remains to me one of the most powerful cases in American history, uh, legal conflict at the highest level. When he was asked by a newspaper reporter what gave him the authority to just seize the steel mills, President Harry Truman said, tell him to read the Constitution. The president has the power to keep the country from going to hell. That was his <laughs> constitutional analysis. Um, but every president thinks he can keep the country from going to hell. So what in the Constitution holds him in check? So as Greg mentioned over a decade ago now, I organized a program at Duquesne University uh, 
on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the steel seizure case, case, seizure case in conjunction with the Harry S. Truman Library and Institute in Independence. Uh, and we brought together some of the advisors who had actually worked on this case with President Truman, some historians, uh, others, uh, actually, I think John Barrett was part of that panel as well. Uh, as you could guess, the average age of the panelists was around 85. Uh, that's always a challenge in organizing these historical re retrospectives is that finding people who are still alive to talk about these things. And then it was just a couple years later that Greg uh, Peterson and the, um, the Jackson Center here did a fabulous job pulling together many of the former U.S. Supreme Court justice law clerks, uh, which really built on that program and was fabulous. Uh, but in my view, all of these historical retrospectives are important to preserve a rich history. Uh, as you can imagine, most of the uh, distinguished panelists from my program and from Greg's program are now deceased, everyone but me and Greg. Uh, but I, I do think it's important and it's wonderful to have programs at a beautiful setting like this tonight in a place really where Robert Jackson did call his home and it's so wonderful to know that some of his family members are here. I, I'm in awe of his work. Uh, and this was a place, as you know, that he came Chautauqua to refresh his mind and his soul, like all of us. And so it, it's a particularly fitting thing. Being a college president is a kind of busy job, but as soon as Greg invited me to this, it was something I couldn't pass up. And this case does remain the granddaddy of the cases relating to presidential power in American history which becomes relevant. I just finished a book called American Presidents and the Constitution, but it is one of the most significant cases even for things that go on today and has a haunting relevance to us in many ways. So to introduce the program I did back in 2002, I was fortunate enough to be able to film an interview with then Chief Justice William Rehnquist at the Supreme Court. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist had been a 27-year-old law clerk who clerked for Justice Robert Jackson uh, at the time the steel seizure case was decided. He never came out and said it, but it was very clear that he worked on that case with J Justice Jackson. So I thought I'd begin tonight's program by just showing you this little four-minute video, uh, my interview with Chief Justice Rehnquist. So we can all sit back and get a little historical context. So Cameron, can we roll it? Good afternoon, Chief Justice Rehnquist. On behalf of everyone assembled at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, as well as the Harry S. Truman Presidential Museum and Library that's co-sponsoring this event, I'd like to thank you for participating in this special program. I have just a few questions to set the stage as we begin this retrospective, looking back 50 years in history. You were just a 27-year-old law clerk clerking for Justice Jackson only a few months in Washington at the time the steel seizure case landed in the courts. At the time, was this a case everyone expected would be a constitutional landmark? What was the atmosphere surrounding it? The atmosphere, so far as one living in Washington was concerned, was very much that it would. Uh, the, the law clerks talked, talked about it at lunch, and it it wasn't just the Supreme Court arguments in the case that received press coverage. The arguments before Judge Pine in the district court were front page news in the Washington papers, perhaps not elsewhere. And did you and your fellow law clerks have any prediction what would be the final outcome when it worked its way through the Supreme Court? Oh, I don't, I don't think most of us knew what position our, our justices would take. We did, we did have a vote at lunch one day, and I think, as I recall, we were evenly divided, but that was not on the basis of what we thought our justices would do, because most of us didn't know. And what do you remember most vividly about the oral argument? I believe it was May 12th of 1952. 
Well, the fact that John W. Davis argued for over an hour and I think was asked only one question. <laughs> I mean, he had a, a style of advocacy that you don't hear nowadays, but it, it, was, it was very impressive. And then uh, Solicitor General Perlman uh, got a whole bunch of questions uh, from, from the court. And Arthur Goldberg participated as well? Yes, he participated in oral argument for the AFL-CIO, I believe. Right, for the steelworkers, yes. Um, and in your book on the Supreme Court, you tell a wonderful story about the justices' conference that Friday, at which they voted on the case in private. What, what do you remember about that? Well, as I say, I, what I, of course, the clerks weren't present at the conference, but uh, George Niebank, my co-clerk, and I were just as dying to find out what happened, as I suspect all the other clerks were, too. So we followed Justice Jackson into his office when he got back, just as we always did, and he would tell us what happened at conference. And he said, well, boys, the president got licked. <laughs> and Justice Jackson's concurring opinion in the Steele seizure case is generally regarded by constitutional scholars as the most significant. What did he say about presidential powers, and why did he write separately? Well, I think he wrote separately because uh, Almost everybody did write separately. I, I think you know, the opinions had to be prepared in a fairly short time. And I think even those who agreed with Justice Black's outcome felt that there needed to be more said about the thing. And Justice Jackson's uh, concurring opinion classified presidential power in three different ways. First, where he was acting with the approval of Congress. And there, Jackson said, <clears throat> only, if the const only if the whole government is disabled does he lose. Second, uh, where he's acting uh, without congressional authorization, but without congressional disapproval. And there it's kind of a middle ground. And finally, what Jackson felt had happened in the Steele seizure case, where he was acting in an area where Congress said, don't do what you want to do, do something else. And there he said the power is at its uh, nadir. Right. And did public opinion, do you think, influence the court's ultimate decision that President Truman had exceeded his constitutional power? I, I, thought, I think it did. Uh, the, the government made some extraordinary claims at the very beginning in the district court that the president had all the authority that George III had unless it was taken from him by the Constitution. Well, you can imagine the press outcry about this. I mean, it, it just made headlines. And it just gave a negative aspect. The government abandoned that argument long before it got to the Supreme Court. But it just got the government off on the wrong foot. And there was an ambivalence about the Korean War even at that point, wasn't there? Very much so. There were people fighting and dying in Korea, but very few sacrifices called for on the home front. World, World War I, or rather World War II, I'm not that old. <laughs> World War II, you know, you had 14 million people under arms, but a lot of things r restricted on the home front. The Korean War, you just didn't have those restrictions on the home front. So there was just a real am ambivalence, as you say. Yes. A and what would you say is the lasting significance of the steel seizure case as we look back in constitutional history 50 years? Well, I think the subsequent opinions of the court have adopted Justice Jackson's concurrence. And that, that kind of trifurcation is probably its, its uh, contribution. Uh, I think people have, have expressed the view that uh, had it come up in time of declared war, it might have come out differently. And so, you know, it's just one of many cases in this area. But I think the Jackson concurrence has uh, been pretty much what it stood for. And I'm reminded that one of the great things about a retrospective like this is it allows us to learn history from key people who actually participated in it. So your recollections are particularly relevant and meaningful, and it puts us in a good position now to step back a half century and examine a presidential decision that's really largely been lost to history books and law books, but is still highly relevant. So thank you very much, Chief Justice Rehnquist, for introducing today's program. It's been a pleasure to be here, Professor Gormley. Thank you very much. Good job, Cameron. Uh, you know, the thing that really strikes me watching that uh, video again all these years later is how few gray hairs I had at that time. <laughs> and it, it's not because I'm a lawyer. It's not because I'm a legal academician. It's because we have four kids. Uh, but anyway, I hope that you get a sense 
from this, uh, from Chief Justice Rehnquist's firsthand uh, recollections, why this remains one of the most important, this showdown between the President and Congress and the court remains one of the most important in American history. And it was front page news at the time. The Chicago Daily News called Truman's act leaping socialism. Uh, the, the chairman of National Steel said, what the hell's the difference between this and what they do in Russia? Funny how history repeats itself. Uh, the New York Daily News said Hitler and Mussolini would have loved this. And you know, so the whole image at that time of Truman coming in, gr taking private businesses, the steel mills, as payback, it was perceived, for the unions supporting him during the 1948 election, uh, outraged many Americans at the time. So what prompted President Truman to go that far? Was it bad legal advice? Was it rash judgment, as some people thought? Well, I can tell you that those who were closest to Truman at the time, at least those with whom I had a chance to speak, uh, really reject that kind of oversimplified explanation. Uh, Greg mentioned Milton Kale, who was just a remarkable fellow. He was a special assistant in the White House at the time. And uh, he was one of the people who was writing memos to Truman as this was going on, spelling out his options. And Kale dug out a memo for me that showed that he specifically warned President Truman that if he seized the steel mills and if this got to the courts, Truman might not have a constitutional leg to stand on. Truman was keenly aware of the danger, but Kale said that he also was very, very aware of the danger as he perceived it to the troops. He was deeply worried about the theater of war over in Korea, and that wasn't a fake for him at all. Don't forget, uh, he was uh, a former captain uh, in the Army himself, and so he would bring together his Department of Defense uh, advisors, uh, Defense uh, Secretary Robert, Robert Lovett and others, and they convinced him that there was a serious threat to the troops on the ground if the steel mills ground to a halt. And virtually every old timer that I talked to said that this was something that Truman took very seriously and he would say to them, what would Moses have done if he took a pole before he handed down the Ten Commandments? In other words, you know, this is not something you take a vote on, folks. Ken Heckler, uh, who was just a great uh, gentleman and I think has been to Chautauqua as well, one of his advisors in the White House, later a congressman, Secretary of State in West Virginia, passed away just last year. He told me that Truman actually had a fairly elaborate theory, a fairly consistent theory of presidential power. And when it came, and he was a real student of history, as you know. Uh, this theory came into play when he ordered uh, the dropping of bombs on Japan to end World War II, when he fired General MacArthur, uh, when he sent troops into Korea. And that theory was, you don't wait for Congress to act during times of emergency. If you do that, it will paralyze the presidency and it will jeopardize the nation. And that was Truman's operating theory. So his plan was to seize the steel mills, force the unions and the steel companies to get back to the bargaining table and muscle them into a compromise. And then came the Supreme Court, which took the case with lightning speed. Some say that if they would not have touched it, it would have been worked out fine by the parties. But they took it under the, case, the name Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer. And after that, Truman never stood a, a chance. Um, the Justice Department did its best to put on a positive face and to argue this is wartime, and so the president can do almost anything he wants in times of emergency, and they tried to aggregate all of the powers possible under the Constitution. The executive power that vests in the president, the, the power to, you know, the, the provision that says he shall take care to make sure the laws be faithfully executed, and then, of course, most importantly, that he shall be the commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy. That patchwork argument just didn't work with the court. So it was a 6-3 decision that was a stinging rebuke to Truman. Uh, Justice Hugo Black wrote the majority opinion, 
And he basically said, as broad as the president's wartime powers might be, and no matter how broadly you interpret the notion of the theater of war where war is taking place, seizing private property at home simply is going too far. If anything, and this is the part I used to always explain to law students, you have to remember where, look in the Constitution, who has which power? Congress has that power when it comes to domestic affairs. Congress has the power of eminent domain, for instance, over private property. Uh, so basically, the Constitution did not give Harry Truman the power to keep the country from going to hell in any way that he wanted, uh, especially when it came to taking private property on US soil. But as we just saw on that film, the most enduring, and this is a somewhat unusual thing in constitutional law, I can tell you if you aren't a lawyer, it isn't that usual that a concurrence like this becomes the opinion that every, no one looks at Hugo Black's opinion in this anymore. It's Robert Jackson's concurrence in the steel seizure case that has had such an impact. And as you know, he was a powerful intellectual uh, and Robert Jackson, you may know, didn't care much for the likes of Harry Truman. Uh, he, he had headed the trial at Nuremberg. He had been the Solicitor General and Attorney General, talked about as President of the United States. And he wasn't particularly thrilled, I should add, that Truman passed him up for the Supreme Court for his crony who played poker with him, Fred Vinson. So uh, Jackson's opinion is a masterpiece, not because of that personality clash, uh, although he certainly enjoyed writing it, I'm sure, but because how it pinned down the power of the president under the Constitution. This was something Jackson felt very strongly about. He had struggled with this issue as attorney general under FDR. Um, I don't know if you know the history of it, but FDR had actually seized an airplane plant, North American Aviation, on the West Coast during World War II. And when the lawyers for Truman in the steel seizure case tried to say, well, FDR got to seize the airplane plant, Jackson visibly bristled at the suggestion that there was anything similar. He had been the one advising FDR on this. And John Barrett, who's a close friend for many years, uh, and I have talked about this, but also if you read Jackson's memoirs, you'll see, uh, he felt very strongly that these were two totally different things because that aviation con company had a direct contract with the US government to make planes for warfare. And so that meant that the communist-led strike in that case in 1941, at a time when America was facing the almost certainty of war, was really tantamount for Jack to Jackson and FDR to uh, an amount of aggression against the United States government itself. That was worlds apart as far as Jackson was concerned from Truman seizing these steel mills. So he went on to, uh, to articulate this test that Chief Justice Rehnquist mentioned briefly there that really obliterated Truman administration's argument. Uh, and again, I think he probably enjoyed that part because I don't think he wanted Harry Truman telling him how to do his constitutional jurisprudence. So he taught Truman a lesson here. And he did it by laying out a spectrum of powers, three different shades of presidential power that existed in our constitutional system. That is the most important legacy of this case that Jackson gave us. In the first category, he said, when the president acts pursuant to the express or implied authorization of Congress. So Congress tells them they are allowed to act in a situation. The president is at the high point of power because the president is acting with whatever power he has as you know, under the Constitution as the chief executive plus the power that Congress has given to him, okay? Then in the middle zone, you have a sort of zone of twilight, this is, uh, middle ground, where Congress has not said you do have the power, you don't have the power, it's been silent, so there the president is acting with his own authority, nothing subtracted, if you will, by Congress. But the lowest category on the spectrum for Jackson 
was this third category where you act in a manner incompatible with Congress's uh, express or implied will. And so there you're operating just with whatever powers you have under the Constitution minus uh, the Constitution's powers that have gone to Congress. And so here you should be particularly leery of the president acting. And so in this case, Jackson concluded that Truman was in this weakest category. The Constitution didn't, uh, in the first place, if you look at presidential power, didn't give Harry Truman any power to seize private property anywhere. So it wasn't in his toolbox to begin with. But Congress had not only not given him the power, but in fact, when they debated the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, Congress specifically talked about whether they should give presidents the power to seize private property because of the FDR experiences, both with the aviation plant and coal mines and other private property, and they rejected that specifically. They, they set out a different procedure, a president had to follow to go to Congress to act permission, ask for permission. So the president here was at the nadir of power, at the lowest possible point. It was only Chief Justice Vinson, again, who uh, played poker with Truman on Fridays, and Justices Reed and Minton, who were two other appointees who voted with him. And make no mistake about it, folks, we had uh, Harry Truman's grandson at the event that I did at Duquesne. This was a stinging rebuke for, for Truman. Uh, he, went, he really went out of office with his tail between his legs. It took a Pittsburgher, David McCullough, to restore, incidentally, his legacy by writing his biography. But uh, he, this was a major, major blow to him. Um, and so I, I think it was Ken Heckler who told me uh, he said there was blue smoke coming out of the White House for days after this opinion. And one of the stories that I believe is true, actually, in talking to people, was that at the end of the term, the Supreme Court hosted a dinner, as they always did, and invited the president over to try to smooth things out. And the reports were that Harry Truman, at one point, kind of gave them a tongue lashing about their decision in the steel seizure case. But at the end, he said, I don't like your law, but this is mighty good bourbon. So, uh, you know, at least they ended on a happy note. But why did the Supreme Court decide, conclude that Truman had gone outside his constitutional boundaries? And why is this even relevant today? Well. The, the first question is easy. It goes back to what Chief Justice Rehnquist said here. By the time this case got to the Supreme Court, there wasn't a sense in the country that there was a crisis or urgency. Uh, the fighting in Korea had, had fallen into a lull. The country was more consumed with uh, the, uh, a pennant race between the New York Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers that summer, frankly, than what was going on overseas. And so there was a sense that these dire warnings by Secretary Lovett and others that there would be some catastrophe if we didn't provide, keep steel mills going in terms of our troops in North Korea, in Korea, that that was overblown. Um, and in hindsight, that turned out to be true, most likely. Uh, it, the, the steel mills uh, were shut down for about two months, and there was no problem in supplying steel overseas. But the key thing, and we were talking about this at the dinner table earlier, it's true with so many of these stories, whether you're talking about this or the Bush administration or current times, it's not about good or bad. Uh, it, it's not about moral absolutes. Uh, it's really about a very difficult process the nation has to go through during times of crisis, figuring out how much power it can allocate to the commander in chief, how much power has to be preserved for Congress, and then what is the Supreme Court's role in that tricky balancing act. And so Justice Jackson's three-part test has really been back in the shadows, kind of lurking behind every president since. It was cited prominently by the Supreme Court 
For instance, when it ordered President Nixon to hand over the Watergate tapes in U.S. v. Nixon, something I spent a lot of time with. It was a key case when President Ronald Reagan um, was determined by the court to have the power to freeze assets in the U.S. to set up this special claims tribunal to try to resolve the Iran-Contra hostage crisis. It was even cited prominently, the, the, uh, Jackson's concurrence in the Clinton v. Jones case, deciding that President Clinton could be sued civilly while he was in office. And there are even uh, citations to, to Jackson right now as the sides are, are sending volleys back and forth having to do with the uh, travel ban cases involving President Trump. So the, the steel seizure case is always there, kind of like a little length of cord around the wrists of every president, ready to jerk them back if they try to go too far. And it only happens when the courts decide that a president has stepped over that constitutional line. So how, how does that case have application in later years? Uh, one of the most vivid examples took place in 2006. I had the privilege of having the chance to testify in the U.S. Senate on one of the big issues having to do with presidential power in our time. That was when, after, if you remember, the White House first finally publicly acknowledged that after the September 11 attacks, President George W. Bush had authorized the National Security Agency, the NSA, to institute a program, a secret program, to monitor and intercept communications uh, by people who were on American soil and others abroad, uh, at that time presumably to pierce the Al-Qaeda network. And so according to the Justice Department at that time, these wiretaps uh, were necessary uh, without warrants in order to prevent you know, potential terrorists to find out about them. Um, the Bush administration policy also, though, which was very important, circumvented uh, an act of Congress. A any of you who have spent time there know well about FISA, the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, by which they set up a special court that specifically handled these kind of secret wiretaps and gave the due process necessary in private before uh, those kinds of intercepts could take place. So when I had a chance to testify in front of the Senate, uh, I, I talked about these things. I never questioned the integrity of President Bush or the Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez. There's no question that the President's powers as Commander-in-Chief uh, uh, on American soil has to be heightened when you have an experience like 9-11 where there is, in effect, an attack on American soil. Um, but then how long and in what fashion does this power continue for uh, a war on terror that, in theory, goes on forever? Um, and so, in my view, as I argued, and it's funny, I had sent uh, this little video to Senator Arlen Specter, who chaired the Judiciary Committee, before my testimony, and the first thing he said was, boy, Professor Gormley, that was pretty good. You got Chief Justice Rehnquist to admit that public opinion influenced the Supreme Court for once, because he was always a stickler for that. But it was very much, he was saying, the context of what was happening really produced the result in that case. But in my view, when I testified in the Bush wiretap case, it was very similar to the steel seizure case and Truman seizing the steel mills. In one sense, um, when, when you're talking about presidential authority on American soil, it's already at a, a lower point because the Constitution doesn't directly give the president that sort of power. But here, there was a... a something that was taking away, additionally, the president's power. Congress hadn't authorized him to act. He was going around the FISA statute. But also, this was directly interfering with the citizens' Fourth Amendment rights, which I argued actually took him potentially even lower than Harry Truman in the steel seizure case. Uh, in the end, 
I, and I would say, incidentally, I do believe that President Bush sincerely believed that this was necessary to protect the country, but this is how the courts are supposed to operate to make sure that a president doesn't step over the line, just as it did with Harry Truman. And so I, I don't think there's anything weak about uh, or uh, you know, defying this, the rule of law when a president does this. It's part of the system to make sure the checks are there to stop it. And ultimately, if a president wants to change the ground rules, when you look at the Jackson test and you see where a president can act or not act, especially during times of crisis, if the president wants to change that equation, there are a couple of ways to do it. First, get Congress to pass a law authorizing them to do it. That's a big step forward. And second, amend the Constitution, obviously, if you're going to try to give a whole new power to the president. But in the end, in the Bush case, what happened was that Congress went and passed a new law, the Protect America Act of 2007, and then followed that up with amendments to FISA and gave the president a bunch of these powers, but putting it back through the FISA court so you didn't exclude the courts from the process. And that was a good solution, I think, to the problem. And so the president was able to do a lot of that work, but couldn't just ignore the other branches of government or the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment rights of citizens. If you look at subsequent cases during the Bush presidency, um, there were a bunch of them where the court had to reel in the, the president. Hamdi versus Rumsfeld in 2004, the Hamden case the next uh, in 2006, where even the more conservative justices on the court who generally were aligned philosophically with President Bush at the time uh, concluded that he had exceeded his power in dealing with suspected terrorists and with those held on Guantanamo in, in not allowing them to have certain constitutional rights. And specifically in the Hamden case, uh, Justice Stevens said whether or not the president has independent power absent congressional authorization, he may not disregard limitations that Congress has placed on his power, a very Jacksonian theory. And Justice Sandra Day O'Connor reiterated in Hamdi that citing the Jackson uh, test, that even times of war didn't give a president a blank check to uh, determine how much authority to use. And so even when we jump now to modern times, uh, during President Obama's presidency, if you remember when he was uh, striking the nuclear deal with Iran, a number of law professors wrote articles arguing that this violated the, the um, Jackson three-part test in terms of presidential power. And just this year, if you would go and look at the briefs having to do with President Trump's two travel ban efforts, there are citations on both sides citing uh, Jackson's concurrence in the steel seizure case. And incidentally, I would, I would note this case, the travel ban case, isn't primarily a steel seizure type of case. This, isn't, this is a case where the president is acting having to do with foreign affairs, not domestic affairs, and does have a lot more power under the Constitution. What's tugging at it, though, is the fact that it may violate other provisions of the Constitution, the Equal Protection Clause, religious freedom under First Amendment, and so that is what could drag this down ultimately. And I think we saw some of this in the, just this week, uh, this past week with the court's uh, temporary decision in the travel ban case. And when it goes to the court in the next term, you can be sure that there will be discussions of Justice Jackson's uh, three-part test in the steel seizure case. So what we've learned from all of these experiences, I think, is that times of crisis are often when we make our worst decisions as a nation. Uh, the fear of communists and socialists during the First and Second World Wars led to prosecutions under the Espionage Act that in hindsight just uh, really obliterated First Amendment rights at that time. 
The panic, as you know, after the Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor that led to the internment of 100,000 Japanese American citizens in the Korematsu case, and I know you had uh, Fred Korematsu here, I think, at Chautauqua not too long ago. Um, that, that was actually formally repudiated, and the U.S. government apologized for its decision. Uh, it's, it's viewed as one of the biggest mistakes in terms of disregarding basic individual rights under our Constitution. On the other hand, picture the tension, and this is something we were talking about at dinner. Picture whether it's Alberto Gonzalez making decisions as Bush's AG or Harry Truman's advisors. Remember what Lincoln said when questioned in terms of, you know, Lincoln was the one who really expanded the powers of the presidency most during the Civil War, suspending the writs of habeas corpus, seizing uh, ports without authority. But he said, in the end, this Constitution isn't going to do us much good if we don't have a country anymore. And so we always have to, there's that tension tugging at us, but at the same time, the Constitution only functions properly even during times of threat and crisis, maybe most importantly during times of threat and crisis, when this three-part system of government works properly. And so the Supreme Court, led by Justice Robert Jackson, clipped the wings of Harry S. Truman, and that was probably a good thing for our country at the time, because if without that kind of check, what we're left with really is naked authoritarianism if you don't have the courts being vigilant and watching. And so what's fascinating, I think, about being alive during this very interesting, complex, admittedly dangerous time that we live in is that we do get a direct view into the minds of great public servants like Robert Jackson who had to struggle with these sorts of you know, competing pressures and take steps to prevent overreaching by the president during times of crisis for the sake of something more important than presidential power, and that is preserving our democratic republic in the United States. So, you know, the current fear of terrorism that is very real today in 10 or 15 years, we'll look back and we'll see it was even more real than we expected, or maybe it wasn't quite the threat that we feared. Uh, but without remaining true to the dictates of the Constitution, uh, I think it's safe to say that we typically lose more than we gain. Uh, one of the great things about having the chance to lecture in a setting like this and to reflect on the, right, the, the life of a truly great public servant uh, who actually was part of the fabric of this place here at Chautauqua is that ultimately we will look back and be able to have answers because we're engaging in discussions like this, in dialogue. And I actually remember uh, at the time after 9-11, uh, you may remember that it was almost viewed as heresy to say anything against the government taking action right after that. It was, you, 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 there was almost a silence across the country for fear it would be viewed as unpatriotic. And the first time I heard anyone utter a statement legitimately questioning how far we should go on some of this was here at Chautauqua. I was giving a lecture on I can't, I can't remember if it was this topic, another topic, but it was talking about the right of privacy. And I remember thinking, this is what will allow our country to survive, that people in places like this can have a healthy discussion and really push the ball forward instead of pointing fingers at each other and just not thinking through issues carefully. So it's not black and white, it's all grays. And I, I really do believe that Justice Jackson, with just brilliant foresight, taught us how to make sense of these blurry, this blurry spectrum when it comes to presidential power. And most important, ladies and gentlemen, he taught us, I think, that it's ultimately not the president, it's not Congress, and it's not even the Supreme Court that gets to decide
how far each branch of government can go in a democracy like ours, especially in times of crisis. It's rather us as citizens who ultimately make that call. So I really appreciate the honor of being here tonight. As, as Greg said, tomorrow is Laura and I celebrate our 31st anniversary. I know you thought we were young, Greg, but our 31st, but I can tell you there is nowhere more beautiful to wake up on your anniversary day than Chautauqua, so thank you for the honor of being here tonight. Help me thank Ken Gormley once again and wish Ken and Laura, uh, his wife, a very happy 31st anniversary tomorrow. We have a little goodie bag here for you. This falls under the shameless promotion uh, category, but it has some things in here that we think you will enjoy. If it's more pictures of Greg Peters that I'm going to sell them. <laughs> also, um, I wanted to remind everyone, I know most of you are on our mailing list and you are uh, sometimes watching us on Facebook and visiting our website, but much of our programming comes up very opportunistically and as uh, speakers and issues arise and Greg's wheels start turning and he starts connecting all the dots. So he has some really good ideas getting cooked up for later in the summer and on into the fall. And there's always more where that came from. So please keep an eye on social media and look for what's happening at the Jackson Center. Thank you all very, very much for coming with us tonight, coming together this evening to celebrate your leadership giving to the Jackson Center and the broad and deep impact that your giving enables. Enjoy the rest of your evening and travel safely home tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>